Natalia said, I'm in the School of Kinesiology and Health Science. I started in 1988, so 31 years. And I've uh, enjoyed a lot of it, uh, a lot of it, most of it. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about muscle. Um, and of course, we all know about muscle. Uh, and, but it gets less attention than it deserves, of course, you know, because we're always focused on the heart, we're focused on brain, we're focused on cancer, we're focused on things like that. But skeletal muscle health is vital for our happiness and for our quality of life. I gotta tell you, it is vital. Of course, it's important for locomotion, important for fine skill movements. You don't think about moving your fingers, right? All skeletal muscle work. Uh, I gotta point to one of two of these. I'm gonna shift around a little bit, but. Swallowing, eye movements, maintaining balance, posture. We know all about the anatomy of skeletal muscle, but what's going on inside? This is where exercise physiology research is at the forefront of, uh, 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 of, our, of our thoughts at the moment. What's going on inside the muscle? And I'm going to focus on a particular organelle called the mitochondria. So uh, what is it about muscle health that concerns us, that is, that is important to everyone in the room here? Well, uh, size of muscle, strength of muscle, and the prevention of atrophy. That is the wasting away of muscle, right? We don't, we don't want that, we wanna prevent that. Endurance of muscle, fatigue resistance, that is the ability to make movements without fatiguing too quickly. Metabolic efficiency, that is, muscle is 40% of our body weight. So your metabolic rate is dependent on the quality of your muscle and how, how, how that works inside. And the mitochondria that I'm gonna talk about are vital uh, in that metabolic capacity. Now, I'm also gonna tell you about exercise and how exercise is good for you and how exercise maintains muscle health in youth, adulthood, and as we get a little bit older. And I'm not gonna be talking about super athletes like this, super athletes like this. I'm gonna be focusing on muscle health related to everyday people. Everyday people, and the reason it's important. Now when I get a grant from the government, either NSERC or CIHR, I make a, uh, 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 a case for we need to understand the mechanisms of how exercise maintains health. I send that to NSERC, they fund me. When I send a, a, a grant that has, can exercise attenuate aging? Can exercise prevent or improve disease conditions like obesity, type two diabetes, mitochondrial diseases, and just simply muscle disuse? I send that to CIHR, and they feel that it's relevant and they fund me for that too. Those are the kinds of questions that I'm asking the government to fund me for, and fortunately we've been successful in those areas. Now why is exercise and muscle health important for us to consider? Across Canada, we have a growing aging population. I can show you a statistic of how we're all getting older and living longer, and hopefully health, healthfully living longer, uh, 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 living longer lives in a healthy way. But we're very inactive, folks. We are very inactive. We don't fulfill the criteria of activity that the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology recommends. We are not active. Think about your own activity level and reason it within your mind. Here we are at the center of the universe right here. And, uh, <laughs> Our level of inactivity is around more than half the people are not active, right? We are not very active. In fact, out west, they're more active. This is an inactivity level, so more than half the people are active here. Out down east, where my wife is from, she's from Nova Scotia, and uh, you're not very active, you know? And, and so eastern province people are just, we gotta talk to them a little bit more. But, uh, but overall, in Canada, and in the US, it's just a little bit higher. We're a little mo modestly better than the US in terms of activity, uh, but not very much. Plus, the consequences of being inactive and the muscle wasting that we see that I'll talk about here today um, leads us to a very uh, high economic burden of musculoskeletal diseases. Behind cardiovascular disease, behind cancer, the third largest uh, burden of economic 
problems is musculoskeletal diseases. So it's, it's significant. So I direct the center, a center that's right over here, about 200 meters away, called the Muscle Health Research Center. Muscle Health Research Center, it's in Farquharson. This is our newly renovated building. I had to blow it up to show you the sign, but it's actually <laughs> a, a pretty impressive, impressive renovation. And it's, this building was built in 1959, so it definitely needed renovation. And our center is uh, in the middle of that, and I'm directing that. And these are the people, 24 faculty members, doing a variety of things. Look at the things that we study in this, okay? I wanna look over here for a minute. We study metabolism related to obesity, diabetes, exercise. We study the vascular system. We study heart biology. That's also a muscle, right? Adaptations to exercise, human muscle physiology, how we get our energy, the biomechanics of movements, uh, stem cells and development, and muscle-specific diseases. We are the biggest center for muscle health in Canada. I'm very proud of this at York University, right? Biggest center, 24 faculty members, more than 120 trainees at the graduate level. So masters, PhD, postdoc, all working in this center. Our vision is to be Canada's leader in exercise and muscle health research, training and education. We use this room right here every year to run a big event. Fill it like it is right now for this event called the Muscle Health Awareness Day in which we have student posters, we have eight keynote presentations, and it's the highlight of the year. We have seminars all year. Anyway, we are promoting muscle health and disease and exercise in Canada, in southern Ontario. This is our 11th one in a row event coming up this May. All right, so a little bit of cell biology. To take you back to grade nine, let's look at the cell for a minute. I'm gonna ask you to think back on biology a little bit here as we discuss the powerhouse of the cell, the powerhouse, right? The mitochondrion in the cell. Here's our typical endothelial cell with a typical cell, one nucleus. Remember that, one nucleus. Many of these little mitochondria which are often depicted this way, little bean-shaped organelles uh, that provide the energy, ATP, for all cells to live. So I've focused for 31 years at this institution on mitochondria and muscle health. Isn't that ridiculous? Yeah, that's what I've done. Now, it, uh, I hope it matters. I'm gonna try to make it matter. I am hoping that this will matter to you. Thank you for saying that. That's right. Does it matter? It sure matters to me. And the like 160 trainees I've had in my lab, they seem to agree that it matters. I don't know. Anyway, uh, when I first was hired, as I said, back in 1988, they hired me because I was interested in how exercise increases mitochondria in muscles and how that leads to better muscle health. Uh, but it's become more exciting since then to study mitochondria. It's become more exciting because of the conditions associated with mitochondria when they fail, when they're not working well, not producing the energy that we, that we want them to, and they produce these molecules called reactive oxygen species that I'll tell you about that damage cells and lead to a lot of problems associated with age. And look at the conditions that are associated with mitochondrial dysfunction when they're not working well, right? This is not trivial. All of these, and so it makes uh, working in mitochondria much more exciting now uh, than it was when I first started here uh, because of the relevance to all of these diseases. And people seem to agree the number of publications related to parts of the cell, I just showed you the cell and all its organelles, the nucleus and all the parts. People are studying mitochondria more and more and more and more over the years and the focus on other parts of the cell is either staying the same or not increasing at all. So I'm real excited that people are more and more interested in what mitochondria are doing and a lot more research being spent on that. So uh, mitochondria exhibit plasticity. Plasticity means adaptability. How do they change in muscle? So here's our healthy muscle with muscle fibers. 
Here's little mitochondria providing the energy. Here are the little nuclei in muscle, and muscle cells have more than one nucleus, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, when you exercise, you uh, make the muscle healthier from a mitochondrial perspective. You can see here the muscle has more mitochondria. And that's what I first started out studying is this plasticity and how exercise produces more mitochondria in muscles. One of the most dramatic things that happens to muscle when you exercise regularly is you generate more mitochondria. We call that biogenesis, biogenesis or synthesis of mitochondria. Now, when you are not exercising, when you become sedentary or under some disease conditions, you lose mitochondria. You can see that here. And that can come about through immobilization. You lose mobility in your leg for a period of time. Mitochondrial content goes down. You start exercising again. And you don't have to be an elite athlete to have this happen. You can regenerate mitochondria, get back to normal again in a rehabilitation kind of way. So I'm going to make a case that with, exer with uh, age, we lose our mitochondria, and I'm going to try to tell you that exercise uh, can promote the regeneration of mitochondria, the resynthesis of mitochondria, make your muscle healthy again. So what this lady is doing is entirely beneficial in terms of pre preserving muscle mass and maintaining mitochondria. So let's go back. What happens to cardiorespiratory fitness? What happens to your endurance? What happens to strength? What happens with age and inactivity? How are mitochondria involved in this? And is exercise beneficial? Some of the questions we'll answer. So I'm going to tell you that mitochondria is at the center of two very important things related to your life. And those things are your cardiorespiratory fitness. Our best estimate of your fitness is called VO2 max, maximum oxygen consumption. It goes down with age, okay? So I'm around here and I'm not where I used to be, that's for sure. And uh, the thing is, the fitter you are, the longer you're going to live. Now, does that have an impact on you or not? Yeah. If that doesn't have an impact, I'm not sure what's going to have an impact, right? The fitter you are, the longer you're going to live. So does it make sense to help ourselves become more fit? Should we try? Maybe we should try to become more fit, and maybe we'll have a longer lifespan. Mitochondria are integral to this measurement of cardiorespiratory fitness because they are part of the oxygen extraction system that's part of uh, the, the measurement that we make on in terms of fitness. So mitochondria are... are clearly involved in this decline, and if they don't go well, your, your fitness level goes down. The other thing is, mitochondria are clearly uh, implicated in the decay of muscle mass that you see with age. Okay? This is muscle here. You can see that with age, that the healthy look of muscle is disappearing. We've got more connective tissue, more fat around our muscles. <coughs> our muscles don't look like good quality muscles, and of course, this leads to frailty weakness, instability, and contributes to this massive uh, burden, economic burden, that is associated with musculoskeletal weakness and disease. So mitochondria are important for that. I'm going to make a case that mitochondria are vital for this process. So how do we study mitochondria in human muscle? How about in animal models? Uh, and how do we do that? I'll show you. So to study uh, muscle in humans, we do what's called a muscle biopsy technique. So this person happens to be lying down, but you can always do this uh, uh, in, when the person's sitting on a bicycle and exercising. You take a needle, you make a little incision, of course, anesthetize a little bit, local anesthetic, take a piece of muscle out, apply a little suction to your needle here, you get a little tiny piece of muscle this size. This is done in clinics, it's done in exercise physiology labs to diagnose muscle disease. Okay? Very, very commonly done. We do it here at York, and it's done all over the place. That's the needle at the top of the page there. It's a little bigger than a, a little thinner than a pencil, uh, but uh, it's very, very useful. Developed in 1962, this technique, widely used all over the world. So what do we do with that little tiny piece of muscle? I'll show you a few pieces of equipment that we use to study muscle. This is called a cryostat. It's a chamber that goes to minus 20, so it's a little bit of a freezer, uh, but it has some parts inside 
that allow us to cut and section a piece of muscle so we can study the cells individually. I'll show you a few pictures of what's inside. Here's inside, you see the, uh, 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 this is a movable little arm and it's gonna slice, we're gonna slice the muscle into thin sections. There's a blade there that you can see, the blade right there that's gonna section what we're, uh, the muscle piece. So there's our little muscle piece taken from a human subject right there uh, mounted on a piece of cork, and here is the blade, and there's a f the first little section of muscle that, uh, that's coming off. And maybe I can show you this here. If you look, you can see the blade coming down, the, the piece of muscle coming down, and you can see the muscle. It's just like going to the butcher and asking the butcher to, <laughs> you know, give me 200 grams of, uh, of ham, right? It's the same thing, exact same thing. Uh, so this is a little bit smaller scale, though, of course. And we put it on a microscope slide, right? Put it on a microscope slide, and we use special stains. So this is a histochemical stain, and it tells us about the fiber types. Now you've all heard of fast twitch muscles and slow twitch muscles, probably familiar with that. Yeah, well, uh, in muscle, in human muscle, there are actually three types of muscle. There's a slow twitch, fast twitch A, and fast twitch X. So these, here you can see, it's based on the, on the protein myosin, and uh, so the blue ones are the slow twitch, these are fast twitch in black, and these are, oh, uh, this is an animal muscle, so there's four in, in an animal muscle, there's a type 1, 2X, 2A, and 2B, these are all fast twitch fibers, and this is the slow twitch fiber here, okay? So this is how we can study these muscle fibers, and we can uh, understand how they operate. Now, uh, this is all controlled by our brain, when we make movements, we call on these muscle fibers to, to contract. And so uh, our brain, motor cortex, operates these neurons, and these neurons are tied to the muscle fibers, and here's the muscle fibers here. And here are the motor neurons that regulate the slow, type 2A, fast, and type 2X, fastest. And you'll see, if you look, you can see these fibers are much bigger than these. These are smaller ones. These, you can see that the blue one here is one of these. It's a small fiber. Look at this big fiber here, the 2X, much bigger uh, in diameter. So these are very powerful fibers. And a guy like Usain Bolt, a sprinter, he would have a lot of these, right? He would have a lot of fast twitch, big fibers, very powerful fibers that are controlled by a motor neuron here that's controlled ultimately by the brain. Somebody who's very good at fine motor skills, fine motor movements, has a lot of slow twitch fibers. Or a marathoner, a marathoner doesn't have a lot of these big powerful fibers. They have a lot of the slow twitch fibers that have a lot of endurance. And this is genetically programmed, uh, and you, uh, that's, how that, that's how that works. But, so they, just to know that it's all regulated by the brain, of course. So what happens when we get older is we lose some of these big, powerful fibers. So if you look here, this is a young person's biopsy, and you can see the size of type 1 and 2. I haven't distinguished 2A, 2X fibers here. I've just shown you type 1 and type 2. Look at how big the type 2 fibers are uh, here in this young person. And you can see the atrophy that's taking place, the shrinking of our muscle fibers. As we get older, you can see the type 2 are preferentially being lost here. You're losing the size of type 1, but preferentially losing the size of type 2. They are atrophying the most. So some of our power, some of our strength is being lost as we age because of the loss of these, or the shrinking atrophy of these type 2 fibers. And here's a graph that shows how we lose our strength uh, as a result as we get older. So you can see here, with age, this is around uh, 50 in the middle, so a little over 50, we're starting to lose our maximum strength with time. And you can see what we call here is the process of sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is the loss of muscle mass with age. Now, you don't have to look far for this, you know? You don't have to do a lot of research. You don't have to come here and listen to me to see this. My, you know, you just look at your parents, look at your grandparents. I mean, I say that to my undergrad class, look at your grandparents. We're, you're not going to look at your grandparents. Uh, I, can, I can look at my, I still, my dad is, my dad is 96. And I can still look at my father. Uh, but my mom died when she was 90, and she had dementia, was in a care facility, fell out of bed because she was frail, 
like this. Broke her hip, died two weeks later. Yeah. And yeah, and, and that's what happens, right? When we're frail and uh, not totally aware of everything going on, uh, this frailty is tragic. And uh, so this is what's going on here. So falls account for 40% of traumatic injuries in the elderly contribute to more mortality in healthcare costs. No question about it. So what are we going to do about this? What can we do about it? And uh, mitochondria play a role in that. So is this a mitochondrion? And I remind you that we're talking about the powerhouse here, and that means they're making ATP, aren't they? They're making energy for the cell. But mitochondria don't look like this. They're just drawn like this in every high school textbook that we look at. Here's what mitochondria look, at if, uh, look like if you look inside with an electron microscope deep inside a muscle fiber. The muscle fiber is about this size here, okay? And so we're looking at a corner of the muscle fiber. Here are some mitochondria that are close to the edge of the cell. We call those subsarcolemmal mitochondria. And then there's others that are branching, 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 providing energy for the. This is where the contraction take place. This is the actin and myosin molecules that are uh, allowing us to generate force. We need the energy. The energy comes from these mitochondria. And look at how they are interconnected, interconnected. These are uh, connected, but they're smaller ones uh, around the edge. And they have a special role, and these are providing the energy for the muscle contraction. Turns out these populations of mitochondria behave differently with exercise and disease, and, and it's very interesting to study because they're different in their, in their characteristics. So look at aging muscle now and see if you can see the mitochondria in the aged muscle. This is uh, from a colleague of mine at, at McMaster. And they t did some electron microscopy. And it's difficult because the signal to noise isn't very high here. But I surrounded a mitochondria in here and here in a young person. And you see the same thing here in the old person. They're more fragmented, not as big. Uh, and if you measure biochemical markers, here's the mitochondrial number going down with age, enzymes of mitochondria going down with age. Uh, and so we're getting smaller, fragmented mitochondria. And I'm going to make a case that they don't work as well when they're small and fragmented. They're not providing the ATP, and they're generating these bad molecules called reactive oxygen species. Okay? Now, as I've been here at York, we don't have a medical school. I've worked my entire uh, career looking at animal models of various conditions, diseases, exercise models. And here is one that I've studied for a long time. This is the animal model of aging of choice around the world. It's a rat model. It's called the Fisher Brown Norway rat. And this animal ages very well. It lives a long time. And it's a very good model for human aging in an animal model. It's about the best you can find. So when we look at a senescent 36-month-old rat, they have lost quite a bit of muscle. So they exhibit the sarcopenia, the loss of muscle mass that I'm telling you exists in humans. The same thing is going on with this rat model. This is the uh, quadriceps muscle of the, of the rat. This is a young animal here. And as you can see, the cross section of that muscle goes down and down and down with age depicted in the graph right there. So this seemed to us to be a very good model to study the mechanisms of how we age as mammals. This is a mammal, right? It's the same as us. So just to characterize it, we characterized it to see. We looked at different muscle types and to see if the muscle mass was reduced. Indeed, the pink shows the age, aged muscle, aged muscles down, aged muscle down. So it's showing the sarcopenia in our skeletal muscles, not the heart. Same as humans, the heart does not atrophy with age. In fact, it gets bigger. It's hypertrophied, if anything, in humans and in the rat. This is the strength. Uh, strength is poor in the older, reduced in the older animal. Endurance, we do a fatigue test. We repeatedly make the muscle contract, see how long it takes for it to go blah, 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 blah. Right, right. So fatigue is more uh, prominent in the aged muscle. So the aged muscle is smaller, weaker, and has less endurance. And so it's fitting perfectly with what happens in human muscle. Now, endurance has always interested me because endurance is closely related to the amount of mitochondria. There isn't a better relationship between your endurance and the number of mitochondria in your muscle. There isn't a better correlation. More mitochondria, better endurance. Okay, That's pretty clear throughout uh, the literature. 
So we look at mitochondrial content because the endurance is reduced. What do we see? We see in slow twitch fibers or in fast twitch fibers, mitochondrial content is reduced with age, reduced with age, and the function, the respiration and ability to make ATP, that is, is reduced in, under the most active conditions of mitochondrial respiration. Okay, so we have poor mitochondria uh, and we have reduced mitochondria in, in our aged muscle. So to understand where are these mitochondria going? Where are they going? How are, they getting, how are we losing these? We have to look at the, at the life cycle of a mitochondria. Gordon talked about a life cycle, but this is a different life cycle. This is a life cycle inside the cell of mitochondria. And whenever you talk about any molecule in the blood or in a cell, you talk about its turnover. You talk about what determines the synthesis of that molecule and what determines the breakdown of that molecule. And that, those two things, synthesis and degradation, determine how much you have. So this is a life cycle of mitochondria, and here's our steady state mitochondrial content. This is synthesis of this mitochondrion. This is degradation. How fast this goes, how fast this goes, determines how much mitochondria we have. You agree? Yes, we agree. So uh, the, this is called the life cycle. I'm going to tell you about two deficiencies that exist in aged muscle, two. We're going to start here. The biogenesis starts in the nucleus of a cell. We transcribe genes. Our genes are here in the DNA, the double helix DNA. We transcribe uh, pro, uh, mRNAs. These are translated into proteins, and we put them inside mitochondria. And eventually, the mitochondria get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger through the process of protein synthesis. And then we fuse them together to make longer, longer, and bigger mitochondria that function very well. Now. When one part of the mitochondrion gets defective, as portions do, this portion here is becoming defective. We have to cut it off. This is the process of fission, removal of a piece. These small fragmented pieces are damaged. They generate uh, uh, not as much ATP, and they produce these reactive oxygen species that are damaging to the cell. We've got to get rid of them. This is the garbage can right here uh, in the cell called the lysosome and we have to degrade those. So this is the life cycle, and you know, it, it, it all determines the steady state, the amount of mitochondria that are in the cell. Okay, so I wanna show you, I just told you that we put, we can add mitochondria, we can take off mitochondria. I'll give you a little video of, in a myoblast, a uh, 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 developing muscle cell, of how we see these processes take place. So my grad student here, Jonathan, looking in the microscope, and he's looking at the my mitochondria over here. I'm going to just do this and see if this uh, helps our visual. So watch, particularly here. This is the uh, myoblast. This is the nucleus. All of these white little squiggly things, believe it or not, are mitochondria. So I'm going to play this at least twice so that you can see, I hope, the movement of mitochondria inside the cell. Okay? You, hard to believe, isn't it? The mitochondria moving around like this. What I want to show you, uh, just if you focus up in this corner, right up here, you're going to see pieces coming together and you're going to see pieces coming apart, I hope. If you, uh, you got to really look hard. Look at these mitochondria dancing together up here. Look at this. Now you'll see a piece break off. There's a piece broken off. There's another, gonna happen right there. Break off. I'd rather watch this than Casablanca, I tell you. <laughs> I love watching this movie. I just, I could play this over and over and over again. I just find this fascinating. I, I really do. I don't know, something wrong with me, I guess, but I, just, I love watching this movie. I just, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep watching. No, let's move on. Anyway, this is the process of fission and fusion, how we put mitochondria together, how we break it apart. It's just fascinating to me, uh, and it determines how healthy these mitochondria are. Now, I'm going to tell you about a special protein uh, that regulates the content of mitochondria. It's got a weird name, but it's really the master regulator of how many mitochondria there are. It's called PGC1-alpha. It was discovered by a guy at Harvard, and we've been studying it for a long time now. So uh, PGC1 regulates the number of mitochondria. If you look at this graph, PGC1 along the bottom, right? 
and mitochondrial content in muscle along the side. It's a linear relationship. The more PGC1 you have, the more mitochondria you have. And in this model right here, this is a transgenic animal. That means it's overexpressing on purpose PGC1 uh, alpha protein. You notice here on the right uh, hand side, the transgenic animal is a much redder set of muscles, right? Here are individual muscles right here. Uh, they are redder because they have more mitochondria. Red is mitochondria because red contains heme. Heme. Heme is a red pigment. That's why your red blood cells are red because they have hemoglobin, right? This is heme inside cytochromes which are part of mitochondria. The, the more mitochondria you have, the redder your muscle will be. And the more mitochondria you have, the more endurance you're going to have. Here's a, here's a mouse that is uh, a PGC1 overexpressing mouse. He is running like a trooper, right? He has got a lot of mitochondria, right? They are, have a tremendous amount of endurance. Now, our colleagues in the US are enjoying uh, turkey this weekend. We had our turkey some time back. But you remember uh, when your mom used to say, would you like dark meat or white meat? Yeah. That dark meat's coming from the legs, right? The legs are used all the time by a turkey. And so they have a lot of mitochondria. They have a lot of mitochondria. Dark meat, a lot of mitochondria. White meat, turkey breast, yeah. Not a, lot, not a lot of use for that in a turkey, not walking around. So the white meat, right? White meat, so they don't, because they don't use it a lot. So remember that when you're having your turkey at Christmas time. <laughs> Dark meat, white meat. You're eating a lot of mitochondria or you're not, basically. OK, so back to uh, the signal, back to the first problem. The first problem is PGC1, this important regulator that I was telling you about, is reduced with age, and that's going to impact the number of mitochondria. I just told you that mitochondria are reduced with age. How come? We always want to know the mechanism, so we look at PGC1. Look at the content of PGC1. This is a Western blot. It's a typical way of measuring a protein in cells. I won't go into the details of that. Here's our 36-month-old animal. The intensity of the signal tells you how much protein is there. You can quantify that. Here's PGC1 in a slow-twitch muscle and in a fast-twitch muscle. They're both going down. So these are our first clue. Why, is mitochondria why are mitochondria reduced in aged muscle? The driver for mitochondria is reduced in aged muscle. So naturally, we said, OK, well, how come? Because that's what we always say, how come? And so we look at the pathway from the DNA to the protein to figure out what, how come? How come is it reduced? Now, if you go back to grade 9 and you think about what's going on with your genes, we turn them on or we turn them off. We all have the same basic set of genes, right? But we express them differently in different people. So it's expression of genes. This is the hardest thing I have for my exercise physiology class is to tell them to this third year class of 600, how many, how, how, how do we adapt to exercise? How do we adapt to our environment? We turn on some genes and we turn off other genes. They're either dormant or they're active or they're suppressed. So what I'm telling you about here is how come PGC1 protein is reduced in aged muscle? Is it because the gene was turned off? through transcription, the transcription of the gene to the mRNA, and the mRNA gets translated into the functional protein. We have to ask ourselves, what's going on with this pathway from the DNA to the protein that codes for the protein? So uh, we looked at the mRNA, and we said, OK, uh, we went upstream. See, we, we knew the protein was reduced. So we went upstream and said, what about the RNA? Well, it's reduced, too. This is normal. This is aged. So we said, how come, like we always do? And we said, how about the process of transcription? Let's look at that and see whether actually the, the gene is active or not. So I'm going to show you something here that is kind of technical, but it's telling us about why, how come the protein is reduced. Okay. So now there's our old animal. This is our uh, um, Fisher Brown Norway rat, 36 month old. He's not very active. He doesn't, they, they can't get them to exercise. They don't want to exercise, they're old. And uh, that's, that's the problem. <laughs> we, have to, we have to assess, we have to get them to exercise, but we can't. So we give them an exercise test, or we use a different technique to make them exercise. 
In this particular case, we injected them with a, a, a reagent that will allow us to assess transcription. Uh, and we allowed, we did a, we anesthetized the animal and we made the muscle contract using a graded exercise test. And I'll show you the, the, the setup that we used. Uh, this is part of my lab. Here is the animal. This happens to be a white rat here. We uh, attach the muscle to a force transducer. You can see a blow up of that right there. We make the muscle contract by stimulating it so that it's independent of the activity of the animal. The animal's anesthetized, so we're just making them the muscle contract with a stimulator unit that's here, and we measure the force. We keep the temperature nice and healthy and moist and heat warmed up, and we measure the force on the computer over here. Okay, so when we look at the transcription of this particular gene, PGC1, we see and we compare young and old. Without any exercise test, young and old, the transcription of that gene is reduced by more than half. So this accounts for why PGC1 is down, reduced in aged muscle. Then we gave it that exercise test and we said, can exercise rescue this? An exercise increase, turn that gene on. Look what happened in the young animal. We doubled the transcription rate of, and so we're making more, making more, making more with one bout of exercise. One bout of exercise. We're turning on this gene and making more mRNA, which will ultimately be translated into protein with repeated bouts. I'll show you that in a minute. So in, even in the old muscle, we can turn on the transcription of that gene. Not as dramatic but still turn onable, activatable with, ec with exercise, okay? And then when you stop exercise, it goes back down again. So it's transient. That means you have to exercise once, exercise twice, keep exercising. If we repeatedly exercise, like I do with this model here, repeatedly exercise, make them train the animal, allow him to run on a voluntary running wheel. This animal is doing what he wants. He can run, these mice run 10 kilometers a night. <laughs> when did you last run 10 kilometers? <laughs> Do you know the stride length of a mouse? The stride length of a mouse is like this. You can do that like this, right? Do you know what it takes for a mouse to run 10 kilometers? It's incredible. And they adapt, they adapt to this. It's unbelievable what they do. How do they adapt? Look, here's a young mouse, mitochondrial content, exercise, increasing with repeated training like this, activating that PGC1 gene. We are getting more mitochondria because PGC1 is the driver for mitochondrial content. And the young, old animal has less mitochondria, but train them and we get more mitochondria, bringing it back up to the youthful level bringing it back up toward the young level. Perfect, right? So PGC1 is driving the synthesis of more mitochondria. It was defective with age, but exercise rescued it. This function number two. How much time have I got? Still good? 17? Really? Oh, man. I'm going to slow down. Okay. So, uh, this, yeah. this function number two, this function number two with age. Back to the life cycle. So, I told you that when PGC1 is important for this side, for producing more mitochondria, I've just told you that exercise signals somehow to make more PGC1 so we can drive more mitochondrial biogenesis. That's great, that happens very robustly in young people and it can happen with older folks as well, thankfully. So what about these dysfunctional pieces of mitochondria and what are they doing? The case I'm gonna make for you right now is that these dysfunctional and fragmented mitochondria generate these molecules called reactive oxygen species that also affect the nucleus, cause this DNA to break and the nucleus to decay and be destroyed. And that's not gonna be helpful for the maintenance of our muscle mass. So, how does that work? So, aging muscle, here's a mitochondrion. 
Here's how it actually works. We take electrons, we break down foodstuffs like carbohydrates and fats. We uh, uh, break them down, oxidize them. Electrons move down this electron transport chain, and we consume oxygen down at the end. And in the process, we make ATP. This is all grade nine stuff, right? Long time ago. And, and uh, so uh, we're making ATP from this mitochondria, and that's why it's called the powerhouse of the cell. But some of these electrons don't follow the right path. They get wayward. They go south, and they start producing reactive oxygen species that are damaging to the muscle. What do they do? They open a pore in the mitochondrion. They force opening a pore, and proteins, like this uh, protein right here, <coughs> escape the mitochondrion, go out into the cytoplasm, go to the nucleus, and cause the fragmentation of DNA. Remember one of the first slides I showed you? I showed you that typical cell, and I said, there's one nucleus in most cells. Heart cells, epithelial cells, skin cells, liver cells, one nucleus. If this happens and you break the DNA with a cell with one nucleus, the cell dies. It's called apoptosis, the death of a cell. And that's how we lose cells, you know, over time, is this cell death mechanism. Well, uh, what happens with old muscle? We have more ROS being made in mitochondria, right here. We have more protein being released from mitochondria from old muscle. So that doesn't sound good. This is going to lead to the decay of many nuclei and cell death. But fortunately, in muscle, we have a lot of nuclei. Muscle cells are long. They're from here to here. A heart cell is tiny, one nucleus. Long cells require more than one nucleus. Here are nuclei. These blue things, these are muscle cells in culture, grown in culture, but multinucleated, right? Many, many nuclei, allowing for the expression and turning on of a variety of genes that are going to help make proteins all along these long muscle cells. You need a lot of nuclei for a long cell. OK, so what happens if this nucleus undergoes decay? Well, the cell doesn't die because we've got lots more to cover the ground. We have lots more that can pick up the slack. But what's going to happen is that part of the cell is going to decay and atrophy. So here's my cartoon of the same phenomenon. We have many nuclei in a long muscle cell. We have mitochondria here. If we have localized ROS production, because this mitochondrion is not working well, producing these bad molecules, creating nuclear decay right here. We're, losing, we're going to lose that nucleus, maybe that one too, and it's going to lead to less gene products, less protein in that area. And so this part of the muscle fiber is going to atrophy and decay. And if you have that happening in a lot of muscle cells, your muscle's going to waste. It's going to shrink, right? Just like I'm trying to show you here. That's called, of course, sarcopenia. So we need mitochondria to work well. We don't need all this reactive oxygen species production. We don't need all those proteins being released. Uh, so what happens there? Well, <clears throat> the sarcopenia, as I, I've already alluded to, is a, 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 contributes meaningfully to the loss of strength, a decrease in metabolic rate. You know our metabolic rate is getting lower and lower and lower as we get older, right? We have the same caloric intake, and our metabolic rate at rest is going down. And so we're getting a little bit, we're putting on weight as you get older. Even though your dietary habits have not changed for decades, but you're putting on weight. How come? Because every day your caloric expenditure goes down. So you're not burning as many calories and you're taking in the same. So what are you doing with those excess calories? Yes, this is why the overweight condition is happening to us as we get older. You're not burning as many calories. That's why exercise is important to keep elevating your metabolic rate, right? keep your elevated metabolic rate to burn those calories. We're losing aerobic capacity, and we're decreasing our functional performance, and sarcopenia is a major contributor to that. So clearly, is exercise beneficial? You know what my answer is going to be. And, uh, <laughs> but in order to study this, in order to study this scientifically, you can't take a group of older folks and say, you exercise, and, and a younger folks, and you exercise, and let's see uh, how how you adapt to exercise, because older folks don't want to exercise as much. So you have to control the level of activity. You have to control it. 
So this is why an animal model is useful uh, in this sense. And what we do here is we artificially make the muscle contract with a stimulator. We stimulate the muscle, just like Dr. Ho does in humans. That doesn't work. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we do this in an animal model. Uh, we take a stimulator, put it on the back of the animal. We run some electrodes under the skin to one side, one leg only. The other leg is the control, non-exercise. And we make this muscle contract three hours a day for about a week. Three hours a day for about a week. Can we compare the old and the young and see how well they adapt and see what's going on? So let's see. This is an animal model here. You, you need to focus over here. Uh, he's got a little backpack on right there with the electrodes under the skin. I have my students are expert surgeons. Look at the leg. It's not dramatic. And the animal's doing just fine, just happy as a clam, doing his, you know, uh, grooming and all of that. And this muscle's contracting and the other side is not. So this muscle's going to adapt. And ready for this? OK. So the young and the old, young on the left, old on the right. You can see here, this muscle here is a little bit redder than this one. This is more pink. This is more red, more mitochondria here. We call this chronic contractile activity. That's training for this leg. The other leg is not exercised, right? Here you can see the wasted muscle. You can see the sarcopenia evident in this animal. You can see that this muscle is a little bit redder than this one, meaning that the, we were successful in increasing the mitochondrial content over here. It's still wasting uh, away because it's an old animal. Uh, but we're able to increase the mitochondrial content here, even in an old animal. And we didn't depend on the animal's voluntary willingness to exercise, right? It was a stimulation system. That's the only way we can control the activity in an old animal compared to a young. So does it work? I showed you the picture. Uh, this is histochemistry again. This shows you darker staining for a mitochondrial protein. You see darker, meaning more mitochondria here. You can see in the young compared to the old, this is weaker. But with exercise, we're making it darker. So that means there's more mitochondria. The exercise was successful in generating more mitochondria in this muscle. Here's respiration. You can see it's improved in the young, and it's improved. It was lower in the old, and it's improved up to the young level with this exercise. So we know there's potential for adaptation in old muscle if we can just get people, animals, muscle to contract, right? Functionally. Here's critical. Functionally, exercise reduced the Ross production, reduced those, the production of those damaging molecules. It's higher in the old, as I said, but exercise effectively dropped it down. Beautiful, because it's going to lead to less cell death and less atrophy, and that's what I'm showing you here, how much DNA fragmentation and decay of those nuclei took place with exercise. Here's how, how it is in the old compared to the young. There's much more DNA fragmentation, much more of this loss of nuclei in the old, but exercise is bringing it back. Not quite, with, if we'd gone longer in this experiment, could have brought it all the way back to the young level, but we're heading in the right direction here, helping to preserve muscle mass, preserve these nuclei, preserve the proteins that are made, and prevent this sarcopenia. So we're Mitochondria are vital in terms of keeping muscle mass intact as we get older. So Time Magazine, the exercise cure, back in 2016, they started thinking about, this is a surprising science of a life-changing workout. I'm shocked at this. and We've known this forever. But anyway, Time Magazine just picked it up. And uh, I'm convincing my people, and I have convinced them, that exercise is mitochondrial medicine, OK? Exercise is mitochondrial medicine. Why? Because uh, exercise rescues the reduced PGC1, restores mitochondrial content. Exercise produces better quality mitochondria, less ROS production, less nuclear fragmentation of DNA, stops nuclear decay signaling to help ma maintain muscle mass. And muscle from older animals and humans and adapt almost as well as younger individuals. So my advice, of course, is to maintain uh, an exercise program, get out and walk. I walk a f at least half an hour to get to the subway, and then I walk 
uh, around here, I'm getting at least 10 to 12,000 steps in a day. I've had two hip replacements. I can't run anymore. I used to run marathons, but my, uh, my major exercise at this point in my life is walking, and I'm happy to do it. Let's find some time to, to uh, maintain our metabolic health and prevent the loss of muscle mass through some regular exercise, okay? Now, I've told you a story that I only direct. The people that do this work for me are my grad students and trainees. And I have been fortunate, uh, as you mentioned earlier, I've had 160 trainees in my lab. Uh, and half, of, half of those are masters, PhD, and postdocs. The rest are undergraduate thesis students. And they're doing all the work. They're doing the analysis of mRNA. They're doing the cells in culture. They are looking at uh, transcription. They are looking under the microscope. Many of these have gone on to take on faculty positions that uh, this guy here is at Ottawa U. Uh, uh, she's in Manitoba now at a, is a faculty position. Uh, and they're happy. I'm keeping them happy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep them happy, OK? I, I try to give them all the resources they need. This is my lab right now. It's a very multicultural setting. I'm pleased to be inclusive and bring everybody I can who is interested in exercise, as mitochondrial medicine, to come and uh, visit me and work with me. I can't keep everybody happy. <laughs> I can't. And he, just, he just talked to me, and he's not happy. But you know what? He's a Canada Research Chair at McMaster right now, and he is happy. He's happy that he's now gone. But anyway, uh, sometimes I have to take them to the beach to keep them happy. <laughs> That's my current group of, I've been very fortunate uh, with my people and with the funding that I've had. So thanks for, uh, for being here today and for your attention. <laughs>